Hello, everybody. Uh, this is going to be the first module in this semester's uh, ECE 592 course on uh, introductory topics uh, in data science. And uh, first, uh, a quick comment that my parrot is going to be accompanying us for the semester. And if she occasionally uh, makes chirping noises or whistles or stuff like that, then uh, as long as it's minor, uh, we'll handle it. And if it's major, then I can record another time. Uh, this module is going to be on motivation and applications. Um, so in each module, it's going to be maybe 20 or 30 minutes long. And uh, I'm going to post uh, the PDF of the module online. I'm going to post also uh, the recording online. And hopefully, that'll make it convenient for, for you guys to look through the material. So uh, this first module, again, is motivation for data science. And let's begin by what is data science? Uh, Wikipedia, and I'm often in this course going to uh, use Wikipedia definitions, uh, defines data science as an interdisciplinary field about processes and systems to extract knowledge or insights from data in various forms, either structured or unstructured, which is a continuation of some of the data analysis fields such as statistics, data mining, and predictive analytics. So one theme here is that we're extracting knowledge from data. And another theme is that it's multidisciplinary in nature. There's math, there's statistics, there's programming, there's data, there's a lot of different stuff coming together. And uh, there are reasons why it's uh, receiving attention. One of the reasons is that the amounts of data being processed have now become very large. Petabytes, 10 to the 15 bytes is now commonplace. And to process these large amounts of uh, data, often it requires uh, using multiple processors and uh, sometimes even entire clusters. Uh, we need large amounts of storage to store all this data and the results of processing the data. And we sometimes need specialized hardware such as, as I mentioned, clusters or uh, basically graphics processing units. So the big data, I like thinking about it as part of a societal uh, feedback loop. In a nutshell, we can say that we can extract bigger profits from bigger data sets. And instead of profits, which sounds like a corporate sort of word, you can think about utility, social benefit, happiness, however you want to call it. But basically, it will proceed as follows. Over time, we have improved computing capabilities. This allows us to process more data. Because we process more data, we can learn more and more from that data. And because of that, we can provide better service. It can be profits, utility, social benefit, et cetera, leading to more profits. And these profits, or whatever you want to call it, can be invested in buying more computers, spending more on research and development, collecting more data, leading to improved computing capabilities, and the feedback loop continue. So this is, this is a feedback loop, which is quite common in society, leading to uh, more and more focus on big data. So I'll now go through a bunch of applications quickly. The first one is going to be click prediction. Uh, you're showing users ads online, and uh, you're being paid for uh, the users clicking on ads and hopefully buying stuff. And uh, you're going to be tracking uh, various types of data related uh, to every single ad. The topic of the ad, the user's specific history, the geographical location of where they are. So uh, for example, if I'm located in New York and you're showing me ads for uh, California, California restaurants, that doesn't make so much sense unless by chance I'm about to fly to California. That's, that's a different matter, of course. Uh, time of day. Uh, you don't want to show me an ad for uh, a breakfast place at 11 p.m. On the other hand, if somebody is uh, uh, let's say, uh, looking at ads at 10 a.m., you don't want to show them uh, ads uh, for some evening location. So there are a lot of considerations here. And the, the better that we can predict what ad they'll click on and, in, and specifically uh, where they'll be conducting their business, the more we can generate where the entity that's pushing ads at them, the more that we can generate ad revenue, which will allow them to buy more computers, purchase more data, and that feedback loop that I was discussing a moment ago can continue. As a personal anecdote, a few years ago, I read something about Audi, something random. I don't even remember what it was. And as a byproduct of that, I had lots of Audi commercials uh, for about a week. Now, 
I had no intention of buying a car. So some of you would say that this is business-like. They're trying to make money. And, and, and in fact, you know, it's likely that Audi, the company, makes many thousands of dollars on each specific car that's purchased because, after all, it's a luxury brand. And because of that, maybe, um, maybe spending a few dollars on ads is reasonable. Who knows what their rationale is? On the other hand, you might think that it's kind of creepy. So there are always trade-offs here, and trade-offs are one of the central themes of the course. Uh, we'd ideally like things to be simple and not complicated. We'd like to use a small amount of memory, not a huge amount of memory there, but everything works against one another. Everything is trade-offs. The second application is going to be speech recognition. A user speaks into a phone or a tablet or another device, and that device converts the audio signal to speech. And, and of course, we're seeing more and more of these things, for example, in automated call centers. The technical approach in the past, it used to be uh, modeling speech, for example, using hidden, hidden Markov models. And nowadays, the approach is that you train on lots of data, millions of minutes of speech, gigabytes of data, et cetera. And this major trend is due in part to increasing computational power, increasing storage, increasing amounts of available data. A third application, which um, during the 2020 pandemic, when I'm recording this in August 2020, this may be a slightly weird topic, and I'll get back to that in a moment, but mortgage defaults. So I know that some of you, of course, are international students, might be new to the US. In the US, uh, consumers, people, families, they often uh, take out mortgages on home. So a mortgage is a a word that basically means taking out a loan on a home. And if you have, let's say, a, a $2,000 uh, consumer product that you're, uh, you're, you're buying, you may take a, out a loan. And if it's a car for maybe $20,000, again, that'll be a, a car loan. But when it's a home, and typically this is hundreds of thousands of dollars, it's called a mortgage. And, and part of the reason is that the word mortgage means that they, they own your home, uh, at least technically until you've paid it off. So as long as you're making the payments and everything's cool, you can, you can live there as if it's your 100% your home. But the moment that you break the rules, there could be problems. Now, occasionally, most of the time, uh, people are paying the bills, but occasionally some consumers stop paying. That's called default. And in that case, the bank or whatever entity it is that uh, loan them the money is gonna lose, uh, lose money. And that financial entity would like to predict who defaults and by how much. So for example, if you default by, let's say you miss one payment and it's $2,000 and this is on a half million dollar uh, mortgage and the next month you, uh, you write them a check and you apologize and all of that, this is probably, you know, this is probably going to be okay. But what they're really afraid of is that you were paying for six, seven months, you paid them, let's say, $15,000, and you still owe, owe them almost $500,000, and all of a sudden you just disappear. And then they could have a major loss, especially if, uh, if housing prices were going down. Now, I said a moment ago that in 2020, this mortgage default example may be slightly, slightly peculiar because uh, actually what happened in March uh, during uh, the Congressional Act that sort of was a, a big response to the uh, COVID-19 pandemic, uh, one of the parts of that act uh, was that Congress said that people, people who are paying a mortgage, uh, if they have any problems, they can automatically request uh, the financial entity to kind of waive the payments for six months. So of course, they're going to need to owe the money later and they'll owe a bit more interest and so on. But um, the banks have been requested to be uh, flexible. So at this time, there are, if somebody has a problem paying a mortgage, then even if it's completely unrelated to the pandemic, they'll tell their bank, oh, it's, it's a pandemic thing. And then the bank will not, will probably not deal with it as an actual default. But, you know, that's, that's a very, presumably a temporary situation. Now, if you think about it, from the bank's perspective, in click prediction, they were trying to predict are you clicking or not? That's binary. Or possibly, did you purchase something for $10 or $10,000? And in the mortgage case, it's, it's a bit more complex because we definitely want to know, is the damage to the bank going to be $10,000 or hundreds of thousands? Uh, 
Similarly, there are other types of financial transactions that are similar to mortgages, such as car loans and paying down credit cards. So similarly, they collect a lot of data. They want to know whether you'll be making the payments or not. And if they think that you're reliable, your interest rate will be low, uh, not much higher than the government's interest rate if you're super reliable. If you're unreliable, well, if you're somewhat unreliable, they'll charge a high interest rate. And if you're very unreliable, they won't do business with you. All right. Another application, which is again financial, but very different style, financial prediction. In this example, there are plenty of financial assets. These could, these could be stocks. Stocks are fractional ownership certificates in companies. So let's say if a company has 20 million stocks and you own 30 of them, then that's 30 parts out of 20 million. Uh, bonds are a financial instrument that says a company was taking out, let's say, you can think of it as a loan, and they now give investors hundreds of millions of dollars. Well, the investors give them hundreds of millions of dollars, and they tell the investors, everybody who buys these bonds, this financial certificate, will be eligible for so-and-so amount of dollars and so-and-so amount of interest over the next several years. Uh, these bonds can be traded, meaning that as the financial markets go up and down, the value of the bonds can go up and down. Now, your job here in application number four is to try to predict whether they'll go up and down. And the data about these different financial assets could be the sector of the company. Are they a software company or a fruit company or a vegetable company, shoes, whatever. Their profits in the past. So obviously all things being equal, a profitable company is likely to do better than a, a losing company. A company that's growing quickly will likely do better. Uh, they can also look at their research and, uh, uh, research and development expenditure, the past prices of the financial assets. So there's a lot of data that they can look at. And they want to predict the future prices. And ideally, they'd like to design a portfolio, meaning a collection of financial assets, that it goes up on average with low volatility. Volatility is the financial way to say fluctuations. They want small, relatively small fluctuations with consistent well, hopefully consistent profits. The next application is a uh, very different theme, games. So uh, when I was a kid, I remember uh, learning that there was some supercomputer that for the first time had uh, beaten uh, the world's uh, chess champion. And a more recent example is that Go is a popular, uh, popular game in Asia. And uh, a few years ago, deep learning methods were used to train on millions of games and they beat the best uh, Korean champion. So the old approach would be, when it came to chess, that you wrote a very complicated program and you thought ahead about all the possible moves and, and so on. And the new approach is that you let the computer look at lots of millions of games. And the computer, of course, it has massive amounts of computation and you need tons of storage to store all these games, but this is a new approach. It's more flexible, uh, requires much less programming than having a team of chess experts that kind of put together a specific algorithm for being chess. Uh, another one is identifying handwriting. The post office wants, for example, to recognize zip codes based on the five digit zip code in the US. Again, I, I know that some of you may be new. Based on a five digit zip code, uh, the post office will send your packages or letters to different places. And this may seem easy because uh, the location of the zip code on the envelope can be identified and there are only 10 digits, but realistically speaking, different people have different handwriting and it could be rotated and even different digits could be rotated and with different sizes. So it can get interesting in a hurry. And the, the current approach could be to look at lots of data, compare individual digits to the database, choose the nearest neighbor. Nearest neighbor to anything in the database. There are of course other approaches too. Finally, uh, the last application, which I'm sure you've heard about, autonomous cars. Tons of data, tons of processing, uh, tons of motivation to make the cars more automated, safer, perhaps easier to drive, perhaps no effort at all to drive. So that'll be it for the current module, and we'll continue next time.